Canada perpetuates this mythology about itself being a welcoming, tolerant, multicultural land of opportunity, when in reality, Canada's nation state at its foundations has been based on the displacement and genocide of Indigenous peoples and the destruction of their lands. Migration is very much a part of, of this nation building project and has always been regulated based upon Canada's economic and state interests. We are forced by the socioeconomic needs to search for work abroad. Even that, even if we work demoralizing, dehumanizing, and destructive to our personal happiness. Since 2008, the Philippines has been the top source of migrants in Canada. Most of Filipino migrants come into Canada as a temporary foreign worker. We work in manufacturing, agricultural, the service industries, and of course, the home to live and caregivers. We are isolated. We do different duties that, that is even uh, outside of our contracts. Our work is, is uh, very dangerous also and we're vulnerable to, to abuse. For the moment, uh, domestic workers don't have the access to uh, CSST. So if we are not covered of CSST, what help do we get? Currently, Canadian immigration policies very much favor temporary foreign workers over other forms of immigration. This despite the fact that the government actually very actively and deliberately fuels popular discourse around migrants as stealing Canadians' jobs, as people who unfairly benefit from the Canadian economy or public services. The truth of the matter is that these workers often actually pay into the programs like CSST, which cover health care when a worker is harmed on the job, unemployment insurance, and Canadian pension plans. But because of how the program's structured, they're often forced to leave the country before they ever see the benefits of the programs that they've actually paid into. An increasing number of migrants are undocumented or temporary or basically um, living with precarious forms of status, which means that they're living as an underclass providing an incredible amount of labor to sustain the Canadian economy, growing our food, packing our food, providing domestic labor in the case of living caregiver workers, um, increasingly working in retail, service industry, basically all of the low-income work. Every year, Canada brings in hundreds and thousands of migrants to work in short-term contracts. Essentially, what this means is that our immigration system is primarily driven by big company interests and those of employers who hire migrants on these short-term bases. And avenues to permanent migration are being shut down in favor for a temporary precarious one. Yo vine a Canadá en el programa de trabajadores temporales agrícolas, específicamente a la provincia de Quebec en el 2008, en la que antes de salir la OIM, la Organización Internacional de la Migración, nos hizo una charla informativa diciéndole, diciéndonos cuáles eran nuestros derechos y obligaciones y entre estos era que nosotros no podíamos sindicalizarnos, que no podíamos eh, ir a la iglesia y tener amigos quebequenses. Y, Lo que ahora yo sé que en ese programa es restrictivo, que uno no puede cambiar de empleador. The central problems with this program is that people's ability to reside in Canada are strictly regulated by the Canadian government and are very much tied to a single employer. What this means is that workers are forced to endure harassment, intimidation, exploitation, abuse, 
unfair working conditions, and rather than being able to assert certain rights, they will favor or they will choose to maintain good working relationships with their employer who have the power to terminate their work contracts suddenly, have them deported, and even eventually blacklisted so that they can never return to Canada again. Yo vine a un invernadero de tomates. Este, en este invernadero había mucho trabajo. A causa de esto, un compañero se, se enfermó. Todos los compañeros hicimos una mini huelga porque no lo llevaban al hospital. Entonces hicimos un paro y yo fui la persona que, que me, me acerqué a hablar con la supervisora y decir qué era lo que queríamos. Entonces, esta tarde... Eh, llevaron a la persona al hospital, pero esta misma noche había pasado que nos habíamos quedado sin luz. Entonces yo grité que necesitábamos luz en la sala. Y en, entonces ellos pensaron que yo era un agitador. Entonces lo que hicieron fue que el consulado me llamó para decirme que tenía que preparar mis maletas e irme para Guatemala. getting deported for almost as long as Canada has existed. There's always been certain people who've had very, very straightforward access to the rights that come with citizenship, and other people have always been denied those rights. The state's always just increasing its power on who's going to be a de desirable citizen or not. And who's been preferable has always been about race, about class, about ability, about physical fitness and political affiliations, even though the way this has happened has changed over time. Throughout history, Canada has brought in migrant laborers to develop the Canadian economy and settle Indigenous lands. This began with massive waves of Western European migration as a labor supply for newly industrialized cities and also to settle the prairies in an effort to push out Indigenous peoples from lands that had been covered by treaties and essentially replace them with a more desirable but still exploitable European workforce. And so throughout Canada's history, up until actually the 1960s, race was very much a main consideration in immigration policy. With the needs for large amounts of expendable labor, exceptions were made allowing for the entrance of non-white migrants into Canada. The most obvious historical example would probably be the Chinese laborers who at first worked as gold miners in the Fraser Valley River and then later as uh, construction workers to build the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Following that, the structuralization of racist immigration policies after the railway's completion. That started with the Chinese head tax, which was used to reduce the stream of Chinese immigration, and then later on followed by the Chinese Exclusion Act, which full-on barred Chinese nationals from even entering into the country. The conversation usually focuses around Canada being um, benevolent, right? This kind of generous state that's allowing migrants and refugees to come in, when in fact the conversation should focus around Canadian complicity. Canada is deeply complicit in manufacturing these cycles of displacement and dispossession in the first place. Canada not only is a settler colonial state, but it's an imperial state. Um, and it is it works hand in hand with corporations in order to um, continue that act of displacement and genocide against indigenous people. And for instance, like there's a number of different gold mining companies that you could name, like Goldcore or Barrick, you know, who actually go into indigenous communities and totally destroy their territories there. Malheureusement, cette entreprise, il vient chez nous, il prend la terre, il pollue la rivière, la montagne, donc ça, c'est triste. Il a m'impliqué pour protester. Je suis obligé de migrer comme plusieurs monde.
75% of all mining and exploration companies in the world are Canadian operated. And this is locally as well as globally, particularly in Latin America, Africa, Asia, within Canada with, for example, the tar sands. Um, and as a result, people are being displaced. El vínculo entre la lucha del desplazamiento indígena y del migrante en general está directamente relacionado. La gran población indígena y campesinos se vayan a las ciudades por buscar una nueva forma de vida y como no encuentran, se, se vienen a, pues al extranjero, se vienen a Canadá o se van a Estados Unidos. So we see Canada being complicit in, first of all, manufacturing displacement, um, and then secondly, kind of managing these displacements by repressing migrants. Para que la población nos vea como malos, no aceptarnos, justifica la criminalización del migrante, llámese indígena, llámese mestizo, llámese de cualquier raza. Después nos deporta y si, si es posible nos encarcela y la justificación de que estamos cometiendo un, un delito porque cruzamos esa frontera. Je suis arrivée au Canada en 2006 et je suis arrivée avec mon statut de résident permanent. Mais du fait que je n'étais pas accompagnée de mon conjoint, j'ai dû perdre mon statut. Tous les différents recours pendant cette période ont été refusés. L'humanitaire, les rares, tous les différents recours qui existent ont été refusés. Et j'ai reçu donc une lettre de sortie qui me disait que je n'avais plus le droit de rester au Canada. Et donc, j'ai donc décidé de ne pas quitter le Canada et de rester. Alors, je me suis retrouvée sur un autre statut qui est le statut des personnes sans papier. Et pendant tout ce temps, euh, l'immigration était à ma conquête. Donc, ils me cherchaient. Et six mois après, ils m'ont retrouvée. Ils sont venus me chercher ici, puis ils ont cassé la porte pour pouvoir me retrouver. Ils m'ont dit que je pouvais prendre comme quelques vêtements parce que je n'allais plus retourner à la maison. Ils m'ont amené dans, au centre de détention à Laval. Ça a été vraiment, vraiment trop difficile à Laval parce que chaque minute, ils te surveillent. Puis même pendant que tu dors, ils ont décidé aussi de me détenir avec mon enfant. There are detention centers all across Canada, the largest being in Laval, just north of Montreal. At any given point in time, entire families are being detained, as well as unaccompanied minors, so children without either of their parents. More and more money, an unprecedented amount actually, is being invested by Canada into detaining and deporting migrants quicker and faster, whereas the processes to actually look at applications and accept migrants to stay are slowly being gutted. Canada is one of the few countries in the world where there are no limits on how long someone can be detained. Detentions have been justified to the Canadian public, often by citing public safety concerns or the need to protect Canadians. But the truth is that the majority, the vast majority of people who are being detained have no criminal charges and are actually there for reasons like lacking proper ID documents or because the agent had the slightest suspicion that they wouldn't leave on their removal date. Security certificates are an extreme example of the use of immigration policy in order to punish people even more severely than would be possible under the current penal code.
security certificates are legal mechanism created by the Canadian government in the context of a larger anti-terrorism campaign, which serves to deport and detain non-citizens without giving them access to a trial or even the right to hear the charges or evidence held against them. There is double kind of law. One is applied to Canadian citizen. One uh, applied to non-citizen such as myself. Uh, my name is Mohammed Mahjoub. I'm originally from Egypt. I came to Canada and a few, uh, a few years later, I get arrested until uh, today. I spent a quarter of my life in detention and house arrest uh, without a charge, without a trial, under what so-called uh, security certificate cases. I have uh, spent eight eight months in, seg in segregation, and I have to go to uh, lengths of hunger strike uh, to have a fundamental basic uh, access uh, for medical treatment. Uh, I spent 80, uh, 83 days on hunger strike to have access for uh, medical treatment. I would like to say the government of Canada in general, and in particular CSS and CBSA, tortured me mentally, uh, emotionally, psychologically, for 13 years. Border controls have never actually been about keeping people out. That's always been something impossible, as impossible as the war on drugs. Um, people have always been and will always continue to migrate. So when we make a certain class of person illegal, it's much less about keeping them out, but it's more about keeping people vulnerable and disenfranchised with no social and political rights. There are many different reasons why people choose to come to Canada and many different processes through which people end up losing their status and becoming undocumented migrants. Living in Canada without legal status implies an enormous amount of stress and fear, which is only compounded by the fact that these people lack access to even the most basic and essential services. In 1986, I had the demand to present to Saint Antoine to prepare my deportation. Alors, en 1996, c'est là que j'ai décidé de vivre illégalement au Canada, de rester ici, de, de survivre. Après, j'ai resté ici, j'étais à, à la mission, au Brewery Mission. J'ai cherché à laver la vaisselle, j'ai trouvé du travail euh, sur la rue Masson, il, euh, illégalement, au-dessus de la table. Quand j'ai commencé à travailler, euh, pour rentrer à la mission, il faut rentrer après, euh, vers 9 heures. Ils m'ont donné la permission de rentrer après. Mais une fin de semaine, non, ça n'a pas marché. Il m'a dit non, il faut ramener les papiers ou bien tu ne dors pas ici. Du moment où je n'avais pas les papiers, j'ai commencé euh, à fréquenter de, à la rue. Quand j'ai l'argent, je rentre au sauna. Quand je n'ai pas d'argent, je dormais dans la rue. J'ai acheté du sleeping, je l'ai caché au parc La, la Gouchetière. Il faut pousser peut-être l'émission à ne pas demander les, les pièces d'identité. Au moins une. La, la période où je n'ai pas loué, j'ai survécu avec ça. Après, quand j'ai eu la paix, je suis arrivé dans une chambre à Vieux. Je suis arrivé à la femme, je lui ai dit, madame, je travaille à cette, cette adresse. J'ai ramené la carte de restaurant, j'ai laissé 400 dollars. La chambre, ça a coûté 219. Je l'ai frappé avec l'argent sur la table, avec la carte d'affaires de travail, et je suis parti. Sinon, je ne pouvais pas louer, parce que c'était difficile de demander la carte d'assurance sociale, la carte maladie du Québec. centro de mujeres que han vivido la violencia conyugal y la, la interventora me, me dijo que me preguntó mis, mi estatus aquí qué tipo de, de demanda había hecho yo dije que era alguien que pedía asilo pero no había sido aceptada entonces me dijo qué va a pasar con los niños si te vas yo dije pues vendrán conmigo a México 
Y ella me contestó, eso es lo que tú crees. Y que hicieron un señalamiento a la DPG. Entonces ellas revelaron todas mis informaciones a, a las otras mujeres internas cuando yo ya había salido. Entonces yo pienso que no hay ayuda por parte de, de estos centros con las mujeres este, extranjeras o inmigrantes. Yo tuve suerte de que no me hayan quitado a mis hijos porque yo estaba involucrada ya en organismos comunitarios en los cuales yo ya tenía años de tener relación y yo participaba en actividades. Te va a ir a la, al Garderí cuando tengas seis meses, que ya va a ser la semana próxima. Pero nada más puede estar tres horas por día, o sea, dos veces por semana. Pues porque no tengo derecho a una guardería subvencionada, porque yo no soy residente permanente o ciudadana, mismo si los dos niños son canadienses, no tengo Yo me, me, me enfermé, fui a, una vez al doctor y este, me sentí a tener un dolor aquí muy fuerte. Me dijeron que no tenía nada. Y yo me sentí, le dije, yo no me quiero ir, quiero, me siento mal. No, te va, tienes que ir porque no tienes nada. Después de cuatro meses volví otra vez con este, este dolor, no lo soportaba. Y me dijeron que empezaron a hacer estudios y luego me dijeron que tenía cáncer. Me dijeron que me iban a hacer una, una biopsia, pero no me la querían hacer. Me hablaban y me decían que quién iba a pagar, que si yo sabía cuánto dinero se estaban gastando diario en mí. Le dije yo a la trabajadora social, ¿y qué podemos hacer? Está, ¿Me podían sacar del hospital? Dijo, el hospital tiene derecho a sacarte. Si ellos quieren, te sacan del hospital y no te tratan. Después este, habló un doctor de migración con la doctora y de un día para otro, perdón, no quería llorar, la doctora se volteó contra mí, me intimidaron, me, me intimidaron y ella ya no me quería, no me, me dijo, fui a una cita con ella y ella fue la que me dijo que, que me tenía que ir el día de diciembre, que porque el doctor de migración había dicho que me tenía que ir, pero no quería llorar. Ils m'ont appelé dans mon cours, la sécurité est venue me chercher, puis ils m'ont ramené avec la directrice adjointe, puis j'étais avec elle toute seule, puis elle me demandait les papiers, de les rapporter le lendemain. Elle m'a juste dit que si on ne ramène pas le papier, on va être exclu de l'école, puis on ne va plus pouvoir revenir, puis on va être considéré comme des, des élèves et sans papier. Solidarité sans frontières a fait des appels, puis ils ont appelé la commission scolaire. Puis la commission scolaire a appelé le, le directeur de l'école. Il nous a dit comme quoi on va, ne on va, euh, va plus être euh, euh, appelé pour les, notre papier. Fait que pour l'instant, c'est juste pour calmer les choses. Mais après, ils vont continuer sûrement. Ou il va s'arriver quelque chose d'autre. C'est chaque année la même chose. J'ai peur qu'un jour, ils nous demandent vraiment l'argent puis qu'on doit payer tout ce montant d'argent parce qu'on ne peut pas payer un gros montant d'argent parce que ma mère n'a pas l'argent. Le... J'ai vraiment un sentiment triste parce que je sais qu'à un moment donné, je ne pourrais, je pourrais pas aller à l'école. puis moi je, veux... moi, je veux vraiment une vie. Je suis désolée, moi, d'habitude, je, je, 
Plutôt calme, mais là, ça suffit, quoi On leur dit quoi, ces enfants qui ne peuvent pas rentrer à l'école Qu'est-ce qui se passe Tu sais, il n'y a, a pas de position, il n'y a rien Mais arrêtez de demander le papier, vous allez avoir une réponse précise. Vous allez savoir combien, vous avez la réponse. combien que vous sortez, vous laissez combien dehors du système scolaire. C'est où le courage politique dans cette salle C'est où le courage politique Est-ce que vous capteriez ces enfants qui ne sont pas allés à le droit d'aller à l'école ou quoi C'est notre, notre enfant c'est votre enfant Qu'est-ce qui se passe dans un pays démocratique et enveloppé On va parler de violence, mais cette violence exercée quand des millions de migrants sans papier sont malades, quand les gens ne peuvent pas aller à l'école ou aller voir un médecin ou avoir une opération gratuite. Ça, c'est violent. Lorsque, après des longues journées de travail dans les travaux les plus durs et les plus durs, en plus d'être payés en dessous du salaire minimum, ils se blessent et ils n'ont aucune protection sociale. Ça, c'est la violence. La violence, lorsque des milliards de enfants sans papier sont obligés à rester à la maison, à pouvoir aller à l'école à raison de leur statut migratoire. Ça, c'est violent. Si ça, c'est pas violent, si ça, si ça ce n'est pas le racisme du système, alors c'est quoi? When we look at non-status communities, as well as migrant communities in general, and access to basic services, we see that these are forms of access that are denied to many other communities. So low-income communities and poor communities, homeless communities, sex working communities, trans communities, are also all communities who've been systematically denied access to services. Indigenous communities are, are constant, we see are constantly denied access to basic things that supposedly Canada provides to, to people like education, running water, um, you know, access to basic shelter. As people involved in migrant justice struggles, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're not furthering the dispossession and displacement of Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We can reject this idea of Canada as this humanitarian country being overrun or taken advantage of by undeserving or job-stealing migrants, and instead begin to build around principles of Indigenous sovereignty, respect and responsibility towards one another and to the land. Indigeneity is related to understanding that people are part of an ecosystem within a particular place. And so when we go to other people's territories, we need to get consent, you know? So it's not like there are no boundaries, um, like borders like have been um, co-opted into like a vicious colonial weapon, but they weren't always like that. And it's not always like that. You would have a river that would be a designator and you would never hunt in someone else's territory. And, and if you did, you could potentially, you know, face like the consequences of their indigenous law. Um, and you'd have to respect their sovereignty and self-determination over their territories as caretakers because they've cultivated a relationship. These borders were established by the occupying, the illegally occupying nation state. And for that reason, they cut right through indigenous territory. I myself, I'm Haudenosaunee. I right now live in Diodiaque, or so-called Montreal. But if I were to move to, say, Buffalo in so-called New York, I would be considered a migrant person, even though I'm still in my territories. Currently, as free trade agreements are being struck in order to increase the free flow of goods and capital across borders, while simultaneously creating the conditions that force people to need to migrate across these borders, Canada has been passing increasingly rigid immigration policies, preventing people from being able to claim refugee status if they've passed through or come from any of these countries with whom Canada has signed these free trade agreements or with whom they have economic strategic alliances.
de Mexicanos Unidos por la Regularización eh, surge en el 2011 en unas clínicas de Solidaridad Sin Fronteras, eh, viendo la necesidad de, eh, de la comunidad mexicana que estaba rechazada eh, de sus procesos de, de demanda de refugio y estaba siendo deportada masivamente. Entonces, eh, básicamente, se, se trabajan con los objetivos de la regularización a través de un programa de moratoria que nos permita regularizarnos. Resistance can take many forms. Sometimes it's really incredible, powerful public mobilizations that defy deportation and detention. So for example, in Vancouver in 2008, over 2,000 people from the South Asian community, particularly elders, blockaded the Vancouver International Airport to stop the deportation of Lambar Singh, who was a refugee claimant from Punjab. I mean, that was a beautiful, incredible sight. It was a, a direct action. Sometimes resistance is these incredible moments of um, overt public defiance. But sometimes resistance is, you know, um, just being able to overcome isolation and shame and stigma that comes from being a migrant. Bueno, estando en Guatemala, este, con mi familia hablamos, más que era un poco injusto y viendo que tenía la visa abierta todavía, entonces decidí venirme de nuevo a Canadá, a Quebec, específicamente, para poner queja, pero en esta... En, en esta búsqueda de justicia encontraba que muchos organismos institucionales lo único que era era negar y bueno, de, o desconocer la realidad. Entonces me tocó venirme hacia Montreal y ahí fue donde encontré el Centro de Trabajadores y Trabajadoras Migrantes, que ellos eran un centro que tiene otras redes de aliados y, y, y era una forma más humana de, de poder contar mi, mi experiencia y poner la, la queja donde, donde correspondía. Y fue así como también yo hice mi aplicación y soy venido residente permanente, entonces me impliqué en lo que es un programa de radio que se llama Las Noches del Trabajo, que habla sobre todo de los derechos laborales y expone los casos de los migrantes que entre veces no tienen voz ni voto. Y a denunciar ciertos abusos que existen en el sistema de migración, en el sistema laboral, en, en todos estos sistemas que, que no son justos con, con los seres humanos. Claro, de, de centro de detención de Laval. Soldacte Sans Frontières euh, m'a aidé euh, dans le processus à faire une autre demande de, humanitaire et avec beaucoup de l'aide, de soutien aussi, euh, qui finalement ma, ma demande a été acceptée six ans plus tard. Here in Montreal, many community groups like the Immigrant Workers Center, Solidarity Across Borders, Mexicans United for Regularization, Agir, and Temporary Workers Associations are organizing with migrants around day-to-day -day challenges such as working conditions and sharing strategies and experiences on how to navigate the system. We try to break isolation through events like community dinners and art and performance shows and push for changes to immigration policy through media campaigns and public actions. This is part of a larger struggle uh, happening across Turtle Island and similar efforts are taking place in different Canadian cities. Solidarity City is an ongoing campaign by No One Is Illegal Toronto that's been called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Access Without Fear, and now Solidarity City. Um, at its heart, it's the idea that this is our city and we're going to make it safe, that we're going to push immigration enforcement out, that we're going to access services, not just for undocumented people, but for queer communities, disabled com communities, indigenous people. It's at its core about self-determination um, and it's about creating community power in that process. 
So for the last 10 years, we've run multiple campaigns, one after the other. Um, and in that process, one, the right to access schools, the freedom to go into shelters, the ability to access food banks, um, and, and in that process also change the broader culture. On its own, I don't think Solidarity City makes sense as a standalone policy. It has to be merged with our campaigns against detentions and deportations, with our campaigns against mining companies and logging and destruction of the environment. It, has, it merges with our Solidarity campaigns with indigenous community. de las entrevistas y todo eso lo estoy haciendo no nada más por mí. Simplemente no quiero que nadie, ningún ser humano, pase lo que yo pasé. Esa humillación, ese trauma, es horrible. Yo me demandaré de comprender nuestra situación porque no es el forma fácil de estar en nuestro país. Yo me voy solo a lanzar el mensaje para todos los que dans cette situation, de ne pas lâcher, puis de ne pas perdre courage, puis euh, let's go, ça va aller, bats-toi le maximum que tu peux. Et que personne ne dise que nos rêves sont trop grands, puis on doit vraiment comme elle sur nos rêves. Donc, j'ai combattu pour rester ici, pas parce que je veux rester ici, je, veux, je voulais vivre. Yo pienso que eh, debemos ayudarnos más entre nosotros, eh, más armoniosamente. Yo invito a todas las comunidades culturales que participemos y nos unamos verdaderamente en estas problemáticas que, que se viven hoy.